Today we're talking about the book of Revelation, and you will remember, this is the, the outline, we are on the seventh week, believe it or not, um, the book of Revelation, and I'll speak briefly to the expectations for fulfillment, and then that next week, we will meet on Monday, the first hour, I will do sort of a conclusion, kind of filling in any gaps that I feel like we, we ended up having us through the time, and the second hour will be the test, and again, Anyone who has internet access, you can download the test from, uh, I, I sent you all email, I think everybody here is on the email, or you can download it from the usual website where you go to, to see the video, you can see the videos and the uh, PowerPoint slides. So it's all on there. The third class, for any of you who are in the Friday class, I will be preparing that and sending it out probably tomorrow. So you will, you'll still get that plenty of time. Again, I encourage you, if you have not, even if you had not planned on taking the test, you have to take the test if you're doing this for uh, credit, for either a certificate or a degree. But even if you're not taking it for a certificate or degree, I really encourage you to read through the materials and even take the test just to see how you do. It's not going to hurt anything. You know, you, we're not going to threaten you. It's going to go on your permanent record or anything like that, right? I always joke about permanent record. I wonder where that is now. <laughs> it's permanent, so it's got to be someplace. But, um, I, I do encourage you to do that. Now, one thing I need to tell you all, some of you that I know want to take the classes, the courses, for credit, have missed more than one class. If you missed more than one class uh, in any of the courses, then you, you're allowed one freebie. But if you've missed two or more, you have to watch the video, and you have to... Uh, review the materials, the PowerPoint, and you have to send me an email verifying to me that you have done that. If you don't do that before the next set of courses start, then you don't get credit for the course. Huh. I, don't have, I don't have many rules. You know, we're pretty lenient here. But the one thing is, if you miss one, more than one class of any particular course, and you don't review the video and the materials, <coughs> and then send me an email saying you watched it, then I'm going to assume you're not taking it for credit. Is that unfair? No. no. And you've got between now and the first week in April to do that. You know, Chris Smith is not here. Chris has had to be out. You know, he's in the States a lot and everything else. He is so, so faithful about sending me emails saying which video he watched and what materials he reviewed and all of that. He should be an example of all of us. But he's almost, I think with one other exception, almost the only one who's communicated to me that he's actually watched the stuff, you know, because he's taking this for credit, okay? So be forewarned, I need for you to let me know that. Michael set that up, so it's looking okay? Yeah, sorry about that. Good job, Michael. Okay. So, um, I want, before we get into Revelation, I do want to look again at the organization of the New Testament books that we've been reviewing here in our survey course. And again, this is a survey course, which means in eight weeks, we are covering the whole New Testament. We only can hit the high, high points. We're not going to get into a lot of detail. I'm not going to give you an in-depth understanding today of every one of the, the four times seven seals uh, that are found in the book of Revelation. We are just going to hit the high points. But it's important, I think, each time that we review the organization of the New Testament books, of course, four Gospels, three synoptic or same-seeing Gospels, and then the fourth Gospel of John, which is the more theological Gospel. There is one book of Acts, the story of the early church, 21 epistles or letters. 13 of those are by the Apostle Paul. Um, there then are, you can either think of it as eight general epistles, that is, which is what I put in the materials that you got, or, and this is a more old-fashioned kind of view, where you see Hebrews as a unique epistle, kind of a biblical sermon, and then seven non-Pauline epistles or letters. And then today we are looking at the one book that is the Apocalypse, or the book of Revelation, which is the symbolic and prophetic expectation of what the future is to hold. All right? That's what we're looking at here. So let's talk about the book of Revelation. The author, uh, we believe, and I'm going to talk in a few minutes about some of the controversy around this, the traditional view, which I believe, uh, there's every reason to say, is that John the Apostle wrote the book of Revelation. Now the book of Revelation has been, um, has been the, the most challenged book in the New Testament. Challenged in terms of it took almost 400 years, well, 300 years, into the, in the early 5th century probably, before it was actually accepted as part of the canon, meaning that it was accepted as being part of God's divine word for us. 
Um, because, let's face it, the book of Revelation gets kind of weird by at least our standards. Now, we'll talk about the, the style of writing it is and the fact that it would not have been that strange to the people who were reading it in the first century. But still, it has always been a matter of some question. Um, it has been questioned whether John the Apostle, uh, that is the beloved apostle, one of the twelve, was the author, as is traditionally maintained. Um, the, yeah, I'll come back and talk about the authorship and the, and the date options in just a minute. Um, the theme is encouraging, it's an encouraging prophecy of the final days and of God's ultimate triumph. It's a combination of several different kinds of things, but ultimately it is a prophetic view of how God is going to triumph in the end and Jesus Christ will be established to reign forever and ever. That's where it's taking us. And some of the passages, like in, in Revelation 21 and 22, are some of the most reassuring uh, passages about what it is we hope for. Those of you who have heard me preach, and, and especially if you've heard me do um, memorial services, and because of the, our population here, that happens fairly often, unfortunately. Um, we, we as Christians talk about love a lot, we talk about faith a lot, we don't talk about hope nearly as much, even though Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 says, uh, you know, these three abide, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. Talk all the time about love, we talk a lot about faith, we don't talk as much about hope. Well, if you want to know what hope is to the Christian, what hope means in terms of a Christian understanding, read the last few chapters of the book of Revelation, especially Revelation 21 and 22. That's what we hope for, that's the expectation. Our, okay, I'm giving myself away in terms of the expectation of fulfillment, which is what I said I was going to do at the end. Um, so this is a book which says we need to have hope, especially in the midst of difficulty. We need to maintain and sustain our commitment to the Lord because ultimately the triumph of God will be established and Jesus will reign and we will reign with him if we are followers of his. Now. The book of Revelation I have up there, this book has gone by quite a few different names. There is no one name that is clearly, it's not named in the, in the book itself, as very few of the, of the Bible books are. The Old Testament, the books of the Old Testament, almost all of them, um, at least the books of the law for sure, they start with the first word. You know, whatever the first word of that book is, that becomes the title of the book. Genesis, which means origins, that's the first word in Hebrew of that book. And so, um, but then we get into the New Testament, and books tend to be named either for the people who are receiving the book, the Romans, the Galatians, the Philippians, the Colossians, or, in the case of the general epistles, by who wrote them. Uh, the book of James, um, the, the book, well, the various of the general epistles, we talked about that last week. This book, Revelation, does not have a title. It is written, the first part of it is written to the seven churches of Asia Minor, we'll talk about in a minute. But it also is much bigger than that. That's just the first, first three chapters. And so historically, this book has been titled by the first word. In other words, they've taken the very Old Testament approach. The first word in this is apocalypsis in Greek, which means revelation. Apocalypsis is the word from which we get apocalypse. And apocalypse does not mean everything blows up and only Bruce Willis survives. That's not what apocalypse means. <laughs> Apocalypse means a revelation. It means um, an unfolding, uh, telling the truth. It means the lifting of a veil. And so, apocalypsis is the first word. It, in Greek, was called the apocalypsis, or the revelation. It sometimes has been called the book of Revelation, as I have here, or the book of Revelation of St. John the Divine, or the apocalypse of John, or the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's because that's the first sentence in the book of Revelation, the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And so um, that sometimes has been listed as the title. The purpose of this book is to assure the recipients, many of whom were suffering persecution, um, that the ultimate triumph of Christ will be against all those who oppose him and that his saints will be established. There's a special concern uh, created here because the Roman emperors were really starting to apply pressure for everyone to worship the emperor. We believe that this was probably written during, the, there's two theories, but the most likely one, the most accepted one, is this was written during the reign of the emperor Domitian, who was a Roman emperor from, 90, uh, from AD 81 to 96, about 15 years. He was the most adamant 
that he be worshipped as a god while he was alive, of all the Roman emperors. The, the, the idea of the, the imperial cult of worshipping the emperor as divine happened after Caesar's death, and they started recognizing uh, after um, uh, Caesar Augustus' death, and they began to think of the emperors as having been divine characters, which was consistent with Greek mythology because a lot of the Greek gods were part human, part god. And Domitian, however, was the first one to actually demand this in really aggressive kinds of ways while he was alive. In fact, he insisted, uh, after a while of being emperor, he insisted that people refer to him, to him as Dominus et Deus, which meant master and god. That's the way he wanted to be addressed. But during the time of Domitian, the persecution of people who refused to worship the emperor, refused to sacrifice to the emperor, was really, really aggressive. And it is believed that um, the book of Revelation was written during that time period. And you'll notice I said 81 to 96. We believe the book was written 95 or 96. And so this was addressing that persecution. Um, let me talk for a minute about the literary genre here. Okay, well, let me talk about something else first. I'll show you a picture. Um, this is the Monastery of St. John on the Isle of Patmos. This is taken from the, the bay. In fact, you can, there's a water line down here somewhere um, that's, you know, looking up to the, the monastery on the top of the hill. Now, this monastery was built a long time after John. There's now a number of towns on the island of Patmos, um, where John was living when he wrote this. But when he was there, it was pretty much almost uninhabited, apparently. It was just a, a rock in the sea. In fact, he wrote the Revelation, according to tradition, in a cave, where he and his secretary, uh, John had been apparently arrested for not giving in to the emperor worship had been sent to the Isle of Patmos, and he, write, he had a vision of the book of Revelation on Patmos, and it was sent back to the churches on, in Asia Minor. He later was released from this. After Domitian died, um, the emperor that came after him released all the political prisoners, including the Christians who had been arrested, um, in, in order to try to resolve some conflicts that existed in the empire. Um, the other theory is that this might have been written during the previous persecution, which was under Nero. That would have put this book writing somewhere around AD 70. But again, the most typical expectation is that this was the later persecution under Domitian. And so it would have been 90, uh, between 81 and 96, we believe it was at the end of Domitian's reign, so 95 or 96. Okay? Um, this is a mosaic that is right outside the cave uh, where supposedly uh, John wrote. You'll, you'll see the little cave there, okay? It looks like sort of a cracked eggshell, but it's supposed to be a cave uh, right here. And he, if you go in there, I was, you're not allowed to take any pictures inside, but um, they even have this sort of notch in the rock about that far off the ground where supposedly, you know, St. John the Divine um, laid his head when he was sleeping there. And he had a secretary who recorded it, and so the, the tradition is, and why I say tradition, I don't mean this is some, somebody made up, the traditional accounting, which I believe is probably true, is that this book was written there, it was written in this particular cave, and then distributed to the churches outside. Okay? Um, I considered bringing you pictures from all the other churches in, that get mentioned, the seven churches, but um, that was a little too complicated, so we, we, I didn't do that. Maybe we'll do that sometime later on. Maybe, I'll, maybe instead of lecturing next week, I'll do a slideshow. Yes? Uh, how did they distribute when he was exiled? But he was exiled, but there was still communication. I mean, there were boats going back and forth to bring food and that sort of okay. stuff because uh, it is a really rocky island. Now there's some very pretty little villages. The place where you land, the, the little village that you land in the harbor is the village of Scala. And I have some pictures from up at the monastery looking down, and it's quite idyllic looking now. But when you realize there weren't any grocery stores or anything when John was there and that the, it was considered a, 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 a rock in the middle of the Aegean Sea, where he was exiled, um, but there would be boats going back and forth to bring prisoners, to return prisoners, to bring food, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, the Romans were very good at having communication lines open. So uh, that's one of the reasons why the distribution of scripture happened is because the Roman road system and the Roman, you know, sea lanes and everything else, they were very good at that. So this is the picture of John and his amanuensis or secretary recording the vision that he had. 
Okay. Um, again, this is an apocalypse, which means it is a revelation. There actually are at least three different ways we could think about this, this letter, or this book, rather. Uh, one of them is as a letter, actually, the, the three versions of what this could be. Some people think of it should be considered more a, an epistle, because it starts out, uh, the first three chapters, talking to the seven churches of Asia. Now, John, when he had been in Ephesus, he'd been living in Ephesus, which is one of those seven churches, he had been exiled to Patmos. There are seven churches that were part of a sort of a ring road, a circle, that were um, under John's authority since he was the elder for that region. In fact, there are places where he just refers to himself as the elder in John, because that's apparently how he was known. I'm sorry, in the, the epistles of John, first thing of John. And so he, um, some people think this should be considered just simply a letter. Some people consider it to be apocalyptic literature, which was a genre. And it was a, a genre that the Jews at this time would have been familiar with. The apocalyptic literature, the revealing kind of literature, the best example probably um, would be Daniel. You know, Daniel is a prophetic book, but it's also an apocalyptic book. There are visions. <clears throat> and uh, the uh, apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic book had particular elements. Uh, there was mystery, there was a lot of symbolism, there was a sense in which of something, something secret being revealed, there's always a sense in which there's a prediction of something that's going to happen in the future. So in that regard, clearly this is uh, apocalyptic literature. That's why we call it the Apocalypse of St. John, or the Revelation of St. John. Uh, there's also a sense in which this is a prophetic book, a pure prophetic book, because it is, uh, pro prophecy does not mean telling the future. It can, but more specifically, it is a direct revelation of God's word. And because this is, uh, these are visions that God has given to John, and he is reflecting that, re that re vision from God right back to the reader, and he is talking about what's going to happen in the future, it could be considered purely a prophetic book. So is it an epistle? Is it an apocalyptic revelation? Or is it a book of prophecy? It's all three which is one of the reasons why it's kind of difficult to categorize, it's kind of difficult to understand, because it is quite complex. It is, I believe, the most complex of all the New Testament books. It even puts the Book of Romans with all of its theology to shame. Um, and that's why you all read, you know, and, and, and you're going, whoa, I have lots of questions. Revelation is the most neglected book in certainly the New Testament, probably the whole Bible. Um, because it is mysterious, it is hard for us to understand all of this. Again. Part of it is because we're simply not used to this kind of writing. In the first century, uh, into the first century, people would have been much more accustomed to this kind of apocalyptic writing than we are. And so it would not have been as difficult for them. But still, it took until the end of the 300s or early 400s, depending upon um, which scholar you ask. Some scholars believe that this was established at an, as canon at the end of the ecumenical period. At, I'm sorry at an ecumenical council at the end of the 300s. Some people believe that it was declared as canon in the early 400s, but either way, it took over 300 years or so for people to accept that this really was God's word, and probably because it is difficult to understand. The only other book that, that had anywhere near as much challenge, and not as much as Revelation, is the book of Hebrews, which we talked about. <coughs> Hebrews was challenged because we don't know who wrote it, and that was really considered one of the criteria for canon, is to know who the author was or to have a really good idea who the author was. Um, and, you know, various other reasons we talked about last week. But even Hebrews was not as challenged as the book of Revelation. Um, I mentioned here four interpretive approaches to Revelation. I want to start out with that just simply so you have a sense that it's not easy for, it's never been easy for anybody to fully interpret and understand the book of Revelation. Um, there are four different theological approaches. The first one is considered, is called the uh, historicist approach. The historicist approach to understanding the book of Revelation sees the entire uh, sense of history being reflected in the book of Revelation, that it's all a broad view of history from the time of his, uh, uh, John's writing it down through all of history. So it's, it's, a, it's a mysterious record of what has happened and will happen historically. Um, the second view is the preterist view. The preterist view sees Revelation as referring mostly to events in the past, particularly events that happened from the apostolic age to the fall of the Roman Empire. 
So we're really talking about the first 500 years, uh, the first millennium. Um, the third view is a futurist view. That is a belief that Revelation describes future events, that it is all prophetic, that is predictive prophecy, telling of something that's going to happen in the future. Um, and if there, I could give you arguments for why each one of these has merit, because they each do. For instance, the futurist view, well, if that's true, then why is the first three chapters concerned with what's, what has happened already in seven churches in Revelation? Um, it may be, and my sense actually is, that Revelation is more complicated than saying there's only one way we can look at it. Then the fourth view is the ideal, idealistic um, or symbolic view that holds that Revelation doesn't refer to real actual people or real actual events, but rather is an allegory for the spiritual path and the ongoing struggle between good and evil throughout all, all history. I think all, there's aspects of all of these that have merit. That's why they all still exist as different ways of looking at it. Now, of course, most of the people that hold to one of these views would say that anybody that doesn't agree with that view is stupid. Okay? I, I've got, I think we have to have more humility than that. This is a very complicated book. There is a lot of very complicated stuff in it. And so I think we have to be a little bit humble about it. But to recognize, we can see it as a historical view of what's happening you know, from the time of John until the Lord comes back. We can see it as something that is supposed to be contained in a limited period of time that's, that's long past for us. Uh, there's some arguments for how it is that, that uh, some of the symbolism would fit that. The idea that everything John is saying is supposed to be the future, that it's all at the end of time and then the final consummation, or we can see it as symbolic. Um, Isn't the most... Isn't the most considered view the futurist? Um, By the normal reader of Revelation, you, uh, or us before we came to class. Well, either historicist or futurist, probably. Because there's some of the things, the reason I hesitate in saying that is that some of the material talking about the churches that existed in uh, Asia Minor, you know, the seven churches of Asia Minor, those churches don't exist anymore. So we can't talk about that being futurist unless they get reestablished in some quite extraordinary way. Um, Turkey now, which was Asia Minor then, it was a center of the Christian faith in this time. And now it's 98, 99%, depending on who you ask, Islamic. There, there are almost no Christian churches there now. Certainly there are no Christian church buildings. The, the buildings that used to be Christian churches have either been turned into mosques, or they've been turned into museums, or they've been destroyed. Now, Turkey today is a very progressive, secular country, secular in the sense that there's a separation, strict separation of church and state. It is not a radical Islamist state. Michael and I were talking about that the other day. He has a friend who, who is working in Turkey, and his parents are afraid all the time because he's working in a really dangerous Muslim country. Turkey is not dangerous. Turkey is completely stable. It is the most stable country in that part of the world. Um, a lot of people, I've, I've read a book called The Next Hundred Years that says that Turkey will be one of the great, next great superpowers. They're completely self-sufficient. They raise all their own food. They have a very stable government. They're in an ideal location for trade. Um, they're rich in resources. And yet, there is virtually no Christian presence there anymore. Not because it's not allowed so much as it's just the culture is so dominantly Islamic that there's very little opportunity for that. Now, um, some of the pictures that I could have brought you when we, the trip that the, the Ohansons and Carolyn and I were on, um, we visited six of the seven churches. We did not go to Thyatira because apparently there's nothing there now. But six of the churches, there are ruins. You know, you can see ruins, but that's all there is. There, it's only ruins. There's no uh, evidence. Of, most of the towns are ruins now. There are a few of them, like the, the, the town of Izmir, is the modern version, uh, version of um, Smyrna? Sardis, right. Oh, I thought no. Smyrna. It's Smyrna, you're right, Smyrna, it's not Sardis, it's Smyrna. Sardis is, out, is nearby, but it's outside. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, there, there may be towns there now, but the ancient cities, the new towns have different names, usually the others are on the outskirts and there are no churches left. Okay. Although you see a lot of mosques. In fact, in Turkey they passed a law, you couldn't just build another mosque because any any Muslim who had enough money and would pay to have a mosque built in his honor. And so you'd be driving along and you see these little villages on the hillside, and it looks like there might be, you know, 50, 50 or 60 buildings in the whole town. There'll be nine minarets, you know. And so the Turkish government said, no more of that. 
you can't just build a mosque because you have enough money to, you have to get permission. So, but no churches. That doesn't mean there aren't Christian fellowships. You know, your friend is there as a missionary, right? That's right. What happened to all the Christians that were in, uh, in the Asia part? They were forced to convert to Islam before they left. Um, the um, Islam was not a religion for the most part. Now, they tended to be, once they got established, they tended to be kind of patient with, they let the Jews be Jews, they let the Christians be Christians. But when they were first taking over, they frequently would force conversion by the sword. Um, and so there were places like Asia Minor where people were not given the option. Okay, they, were, they were forced conversions. Um, anyway, so yeah, it was, it's a very different story than the story of Christian evangelism. So these are, the, these are the various versions to it. I want to talk for a minute now about, let's see what I have next. Uh, okay, we'll get into the outline there. Uh, I want to talk about the authorship and some of the controversies around it. The traditional view, again, is that this was written by John the Apostle, who was traditionally also the author of the Gospel of John and of the three epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Um, that's why it's called the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and the Revelation of St. John the Divine. Uh, but there have been some questions about that, like there have been everything else. Uh, starting in the 19th and early 20th century, some scholars who you know, I believe in scholarship. I believe we really need to study the Bible and really do a good job, but I think sometimes scholars make up stuff because they need to come up with something new. And so the theory started developing that, that there was a difference between John the Elder, who wrote the three epistles of John, and John the Apostle, who may or may not have written the Gospel of John, and uh, you know, John the Evangelist was another character, and so they were coming up with all these different Johns. Um, well, the... <laughs> John was a very common name back then, as it is today, as, as you know. But the absolute early church traditional belief was that the book of Revelation was written by John the Apostle, who was one of the twelve, who wrote the Gospel of John and the three epistles of John. And there really is no reason, other than academic you know, fancy-making, for us to consider that anything else was true. In fact, we have very strong testimony Justin Martyr, one of the early church fathers who lived from, from 100 to 165. So we're only talking a few years after this book was written. Justin Martyr was a close associate of Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna. All right? um, Polycarp had been close friends as a young man with John the Apostle. So John the Apostle... Close friends with Polycarp. Polycarp was a mentor to Justin Martyr, who just a very few years after this was written and after John's death, testified that Polycarp absolutely knew for a fact that this was written by John the Apostle when he was exiled on Patmos. We have a lot of other early church fathers, uh, Irenaeus, um, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, Origen of Alexandria, Methodius, Cyprian, Lactantius, Lactantius, Dionysius of Alexandria, Eusebius, I just wanted to show you how to pronounce those names, mostly. <laughs> mostly. Uh, mostly. All of them accepted it as a given. And these are the early church fathers whose dates range from, again, 100 up until the mid-200s. They all took it as a given uh, uh, that John the Apostle was the writer of this. It wasn't for another 1,800 plus years that anyone seriously started questioning whether or not John wrote this. And their motivation for saying that is they say, well, there are some differences between the use of language in the book of Revelation and in John's Gospel and other, uh, you know, the uh, epistles of John. But not significant. And in, uh, in many other cases, um, more traditional scholars have gone back and taken the writings of secular writers, I mean novels, for instance, and they say, or of Shakespeare, and say, you know, look, look at this early writing and this later writing and compare the language and see if it hasn't changed. Some of it changes because of there may be a, a development in terms of thinking. There may be that they had a secretary that assisted them and they interjected some of their own vocabulary or their own sentence structure, whatever the reason. It's been pretty much concluded that differences in st uh, style, stylistic differences, are not grounds for trying to decide whether or not something was written by the same author. The fact is that the themes in the Gospel of John, particularly the soteriological themes, that is the themes of, uh, related to salvation, 
The Christology, the, the view of Jesus Christ as being a very high Christology, the divine nature of Jesus as the Son of God, is very consistent between the Gospel of John and the Apocalypse of John. And so I believe there is no real reason for believing, and in fact I should say, in more recent times, in the last 35, 30, 35 years, there have been more scholars, real high class scholars, who have come along and said, you guys have been making this stuff up. There's no reason to believe that this is not John the Apostle. You know? um, and so scholarship on a lot of these kinds of things, the dating of these books, as well as the authorship of, of biblical books, has really been, the ship has been turning a lot in the last 30 or 40 years, and scholars are coming along now saying, even, even if they're not evangelical, they're beginning to say, you know, there's no reason for you guys to have challenged traditional beliefs on this. Um, so we, we've come back around quite a bit. But there are still people who will talk about, oh, John the Apostle, John the Evangelist, John of Patmos, uh, John the Elder. I actually, uh, I, was, I spoke, um, it was at a, a memorial service. It was, it was David Nevitt's memorial service, and I quoted John, and I said, John the Apostle wrote, had somebody come up to me afterwards and said, you really believe that John the Apostle wrote that? And I went, well, yeah, I do. <laughs> and so you still get people out there who will say, oh, no, 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 that was a different John. It was much later. It was blah, blah, blah. Right? Uh, I, I have no recollection of, of reading where the authors, Paul, or whom had, had uh, secretaries. Where is that information? Where does that, what's the word of Well, it's actually in some of the books. Paul refers to the fact that uh, he gives the name of uh, one of his secretaries in his Colossians? Well, Tertius, they give the name. Um, and the, I don't believe we have a specific on John's secretary, but the, the tradition is that a lot of these guys had secretary. John Mark is expected to be, the, was thought to have been the secretary to Peter. In fact, it was traditionally clearly understood. They were assistants, traveling companions, roadies, and secretaries. And so, and again, in at least one case, Paul actually names, uh, names his secretary. And in fact, doesn't the secretary himself say, I'm sending my greetings? Exactly. Yes. And, I, and I'm sending my greetings as well, because he personally knew the people there. And then there's the place where Paul says, and I, you'll notice that I'm writing this close, the closing remarks in my own hand. Okay. Notice how, how big the letters are. Okay. Which meant a secretary, amanuensis was the, the word for it, would have done the writing up until then, and then in order to just simply make them aware that this really is me, and I'm just, uh, you know, I care enough about you to write my own closing. Uh, and that's one of the suggestions that Paul had bad eyesight, is that when he wrote something, it had to be in big letters, because he couldn't write small letters. Um, so, you get that idea. Now, but again, saying that somebody had a secretary, it might very well be that, that in some cases, Paul, in some of his letters, he might have dictated it his thoughts and said, I want to get this and this and this and there and there. And then the secretary might have drafted it and then Paul approved it, which means that's why you might have had language sneak into it that might not sound like something Paul wrote elsewhere. But the theme is the same. The content is the same. You know, the message has not been altered, even though somebody else may have drafted it for him according to his instructions. That was quite common back then. Um, okay. About the dating, I mentioned the fact that it is, it's traditionally considered to have been written during the time of Domitian, around the year 95, 96, because Domitian reigned from 80, 81 to 96. The other um, persecution before that would have been under Nero, which would have been 68 or 69. And so the suggestion is that this might have been written during that earlier persecution. Neither one of, them, of those things would have been, it's not problematic to us. It's not a faith issue. If you wrote it, um, you know, almost 30 years earlier under Nero, what, if that was the time in which he was exiled, that wouldn't be a problem for us in terms of belief. But it does fit overall uh, cleaner to, and that's why the traditional view, in fact, there is one, uh, one early reference that says he wrote it during the time of Domitian. And so 95, 96 fits in there. We do know for a fact that Paul lived later. He was released from Patmos by the emperor who came after Domitian. He went back to Ephesus, lived there for a few years longer, but, but Paul, uh, uh, John lived very late. He, I mean, he lived to be a very old man. Um, we believe that he was probably close to 100 when he, when he died. So that's why he was called the elder. And he got to the point where, as I mentioned before, he had to be carried around in a sedan chair to the various churches where he could preach and teach and, you know, and, and be the elder kind of mentor to the other pastors and whatnot. But... Um, 
Again, the traditional view we believe is still the best one, and that is that it is uh, 96, somewhere in 95, 96 when it was written. Okay? Uh, any questions about any of that? Yes, Michael. He writes this about seven churches, and it almost sounds like that should be taken out and sent as a letter to the seven churches. Right. But I don't quite understand why it's all together in one company. Well, he had it as one vision. The interesting thing is, it's not actually addressed to the seven churches. It's addressed to the angels of the seven churches. And so even that, although it's fairly specific in what he's communicating to these churches, there is still a symbolic sort of apocalyptic vision kind of aspect to it as well. Um, and he goes from that directly into the, the sort of symbolic, mysterious visions of the seals and all, the throne of God and all that kind of thing. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about that. We'll get into the seven churches in a little while and what he has to say to them. Um, any other questions about where we are so far? Okay. I mentioned that this, this, church, this uh, book was one of the last, in fact, it was the last, to be accepted as part of the New Testament canon. You will remember canon means the books that are officially recognized as being divinely inspired for our instruction. The word canon is from the Greek word kanon, which was a yardstick. It literally means these are the books that God gave us as a yardstick for our lives. So, the, again, there's some question as to whether or not Revelation was accepted at the Council of Carthage in 397 AD, which would have been just over 300 years after it was written, we believe. Or, according to some scholars, it actually wasn't officially accepted until the Council in 419. Um, whichever the case was, you get the sense that it was over 300 years between the time this was written and the time it was finally accepted. Various uh, intermediate, that is between the writing and the uh, 400 or so, various collections of scriptures, most of them included it, because even before it became canon, there would be a traditional acceptance of that these are the books God has given us. Most of them had uh, revelation, some of them didn't. There was still dispute, because it is just kind of a very different kind of book. Um, and as I said, the, the most uh, ignored book in scripture, certainly in the New Testament, probably in all of scripture, simply because people have so much trouble understanding it. I've, I've taught it twice, and I hope it's a long time before I have to teach it again. <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's just a hard one. It's a difficult thing to understand, and partly because we don't really know exactly what some of this stuff means. We can only, uh, based upon what the rest of Scripture says, based upon what we understand about writing in that time, Jewish thinking, etc., we can have a good sense of it, but we don't know exactly. And so most people, you know, they say, oh, I want to study Revelation, because they think they're getting at all the answers. They study it very hard for a very long time, and they still don't come up with all the answers because that's not for us to know right now. It'll be kind of fun to figure out, find the, all that out someday, all right? Um, one of the things about this book is it focuses very, very heavily on the Old Testament. There are 348 allusions to Old Testament uh, things in the book of Revelation, 348. Indirect quotes or references to something that's in the Old Testament um, the references come primarily from Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Psalms. You get particular, like the visions of Daniel, Daniel 7 and elsewhere. Descriptions of the angel um, who gives the revelation is clearly a reference to Daniel's vision in Daniel 10. The four horsemen that appear, uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse, as they're frequently called, uh, is a direct reference to Zechariah 6. The idea of lampstands and olive trees representing the two men or angelic figures comes from Zechariah 4 and on and on. There's all of this symbolism that is taken from the Old Testament. That's why I say the Jewish people who would have read this in, after John wrote it, it would not have been nearly as mysterious to them as it is to us. And probably the Gentiles who were reading it then, there were enough converted Jewish uh, Christians in the churches, they would have helped them to understand it. So it would not have been nearly as difficult for them as it is for us. In terms of structure, the book of Revelation is built in seven sections. And in fact, the number seven, which is considered one of the holy numbers, three and seven are the <coughs> holiest numbers in Scripture. Uh, seven is seen as a combination of the Trinity, plus four was representative of the four winds and the four corners of the earth and the four evangelists and lots of other things. So seven was seen as a combination of the nature of God and of God's manifest uh, manifest declarations to us in creation and in scripture. 
So the number seven happens over and over and over again. There are seven sections. Each section is, uh, has an introductory piece followed by seven revelations. Um, and these sections, these seven sections, are written in a chiasm. Chiasm is like a literary mirror image where you get things will sort of double back on itself and you'll see the other side. And so this is the literary structure is very complicated. That's why you get, you know, <coughs> seven seals and then the lampstands. And you get this re replication of symbolism over again because these are mirror images. That Now the book of Daniel is exactly like that. Um, if you were in our Old Testament survey class, you'll remember that the book of Daniel, the first half of it is written in, in Aramaic, Chaldean, because Daniel was in Babylon at the time. The second half of it is written in Hebrew. Well, the, the Aramaic or Babylonian half and the Hebrew half are chiasm to each other, are chi chiastic to each other. They are mirror images. There are symbols in the first half that are reflected in the second half, the same number, but slightly different, but they end up meaning the same thing. You get some of the same kind of structure in the book of Revelation. And so part of it, you're reading you're reading all of these different symbols and all of this different stuff that's happening in the seals and da-da-da. And much of this is a repetition for emphasis. It's, a, it's a, a very creative literary representation of this stuff. There are four overall divisions in Revelation, each of them involving a vision of John, that John sees the plan of God unveiled four different times in four different ways and then an epilogue that concludes the book. So there's a lot of very, very intentional, very specific kind of structure built into this thing. Um, talking about the sevens again. The seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowl judgments. Um, the, and then seven is cut in half in places, and three and a half is used as a conspicuous number. Um, two witnesses are given power, given power to prophesy for three and a half years uh, in terms of 1260 days, which is half of the Hebrew year, which was 360 days. The dead bodies lie in the street in Jerusalem after the witnesses are killed for three and a half days. The woman who is clothed with the sun is protected in the wilderness for three and a half years. Gentiles tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months, or three and a half years. The beast is given authority to continue for 42 months, or three and a half years. This is one of the reasons that some people see the book of Revelation as being idealistic or symbolic is because there's so much um, of, exact, of the repetition of these kinds of numbers that some people have interpreted as saying that, that that doesn't sound like he's describing reality. It sounds like it's intended to be symbolic all the way through. And so I think there is some sense in which all of those things are true. Um, let's talk about what is actually in the book of Revelation now. I want to, to uh, sort of walk us through it. Um, we'll start with this and then we'll take a break. It starts out with an introduction. The introduction um, identifies Paul, or Paul, John, George, Ringo. <laughs> John identifies himself. He just says John. He doesn't call himself John the Apostle or anything else. But that's actually probably a pretty strong testimony that this is John the Apostle because he's writing to churches that knew him so well, he wouldn't, he wouldn't define himself more. If I call somebody I know really well, I don't say, hi, this is Ross Arnold, pastor of the Presbyterian Church. You know, I say, hey, it's Ross, and they know who I am. The fact that he doesn't identify himself more specifically is probably an indication that he is the John who would have been so well known by these churches and not somebody else, not John of Patmos or or John, you know, John Neal, somebody else. Uh, he identifies himself, he talks about who he's writing to, the seven churches in Asia, and that this is a vision from God. Then he goes into the seven Asian churches, first describing that the Son of Man, as John sees him in a vision, and then he starts with the seven churches. Now, I'm going to jump down then and then come back to this. Uh, where are they? Uh, there. This is Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. This is what we call modern-day Greece, which have been uh, Macedonia, Achaia, uh, down here, Mediterranean Sea, the island of Cyprus, this is the Holy Land, this is Egypt, okay, uh, Libya, you get the picture. Here in, in uh, Western Asia Minor, it's very hard for you to see, but the lighter color here, there are seven churches, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, 
Philadelphia, Laodicea, Ephesus, and Smyrna. They're actually, Ephesus here is where John lived for most of the time. This is Patmos. This is where the island is, where he was exiled. When he wrote, there was a road that connected all of these. It was a trade route. It was a circle. And so if you follow the order in which he uh, talks about these churches, he actually is following that trade route. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Okay? So there's a circle here. There's a cycle of churches. And there were churches that were there at that time. Okay? Um, there aren't any more. But there were then. <laughs> Just still bothers me. <laughs> Okay, uh, the first church that he writes to uh, is the church in Ephesus, which would have been the church that he, was, he knew best, the church that he was most familiar with. And the, the church in Ephesus, he says to them, um, I know your works, you labor um, your patience, your labor your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Um, he talks, he praises them for not bearing those who are evil, particularly he mentions the fact that they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were a Gnostic sect at that time. You, we talked about the Gnostics. They, they denied the, the resurrection because they believed that, or they denied the incarnation and the resurrection because they believed that Jesus only appeared in spirit. They denied any, any value to the human or physical uh, side of Jesus. They also believed that since the physical world didn't matter and was actually evil, that what you did in the physical body didn't matter, didn't hurt. So in that way, they were antinomian. The antinomians, uh, that's, a, that's a sort of philosophical view, that, that there's no such thing as sin. Whatever you do in the body, if, if, you're, if you're saved, then do whatever you want. There's no problem. Um, there was no, this was really contrary to the book of James. James who says you have, to, you have to show your righteousness by how you live your life. The antinomians, the Gnostics, the Nicolaitans would have said what you do in your body doesn't matter. You can party hardy, you can go to orgies three times a week, doesn't matter because God loves you, you've accepted him and so you're fine. That's not scriptural, that's part of what the heresy was and it had to do with the fact they didn't put any countenance or any value in the physical or material world. So what you did with your physical body didn't matter. So the, uh, John appraises the Ephesians for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans, uh, for having persevered and for possessing patience against persecution. Ephesus is one of the cities where there was both persecution from the Jews, uh, the Jewish synagogue gave him trouble. There was, as you'll recall from uh, the book of Acts, Paul suffered from persecution from the pagan cults because Christianity threatened to remove the, the income stream from selling little idols and stuff. And there was also the pers persecution from the imperial cult. In fact, Ephesus had been quite famous for establishing um, temples to the imperial cult, and as well as the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So Paul actually compliments the Ephesians, but he also admonishes them to do the first works, which are the works of loving each other and evangelizing, and then to repent from having left their first love, which is means the focus on the gospel and their focus on Jesus Christ as their first law. Okay? So in almost every one of these cases, almost every one, uh, John both compliments the church for something and then he calls them to account for something. Either something they're doing wrong or something they can do more of that they can focus on. In Smyrna, modern day Izmir, which is right on the coast, it's a beautiful city, we can recommend a hotel to you if you're headed there. Um, so, it's in Smyrna, uh, John says to this church that uh, those people had been faithful unto death. They would be given the crown of life because of that, and that those who have overcome would not be hurt by the second death. I know some people want to talk Revelation before. They really want me to teach it because they were scared by this idea of the second death. What is the second death? Well, what John is talking about very simply is that we all die physically. But after that, you know, it is appointed that the man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. The second death would be those who have not accepted Christ, who when it comes to a time of judgment, they are condemned because of their failure to accept Jesus Christ. That's what the second death is. It's damnation. It's condemnation for failing to accept God in Christ. And so the people at Smyrna, uh, 
John tells them, you've done well, all of you, all those who have gone before who have maintained the faith, and those of you who maintain it now in the face of persecution. Remember, this book is clearly talking about persecution for the church. They would not be hurt by the second death. He, taught, he praises the Smyrna uh, church for being rich um, in terms of their faith, even though they were impoverished uh, monetarily. One of the things that happened is when, a, when a, somebody was arrested as a Christian, like when John was sent to Patmos, any property that he owned would have been forfeited. They would have taken it away from him. So one of the things that happened in the early churches, if they were if they were judged for not worshiping the emperors, they would take everything they had away from them. And so impoverishment was a real result of having been Christian back then. That is financial impoverishment. Uh, he admonished them not to fear the synagogue of Satan or to uh, fear the tribulation of being thrown into prison. There are a couple of references that he makes here to the synagogue of Satan, or in the case of in Pergamum, he talks about the the throne of Satan. Um, in each case, we believe that was referring to significant pagan temples. The throne of Satan was thought it was a very in Pergamum was a very significant temple that was built to Zeus, and it was believed there were prophecies that came out of the temple to Zeus in Pergamum. So you get those references. Um, in Pergamum, I know your works and where you live, where Satan's throne is. That's the temple of Zeus I was just referring to. Um, Pergamum, fascinating city, a city up on a hill. There, that's the place that was famous for making uh, parchment. In fact, the original language word for parchment comes from Pergamum, which was a, a variant of the name Pergamum. And the, they were praised in Pergamum by John for holding fast to the name of Christ, for not denying the faith. Um, even in the days of Antipas, his uh, faithful martyr, they're admonished to repent for having held the, the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to be a stumbling block before the children of Israel, basically eating things sacrificed to idols, back to that Nicolaitan uh, heresy. Both Pergamum and Ephesus had suffered to, from the false teaching of the Gnostics, the, the cult of the Nicolaitans, and both of them were encouraged to fight that. Okay? One of the reasons I'm going through this with all these churches is because I think it's valuable. It tells us some of what the issues they were dealing with. Okay. Uh, Thyatira is the one place where there are no ruins or anything left. That's the one place in the visit we took to Asia Minor we didn't go to because apparently there's nothing there. Um, John, speaking for Christ, says to the Thyatirans that uh, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. He praises them for that. He admonishes them to repent from following a prophetess who had come into their midst to promote sexual immorality. And this goes back to some of the things in Paul, where Paul's admonitions to some of the churches he's writing to seems to be to tell them, don't follow these women who have come from the pagan cults who are trying to get you to do things that are contrary to the gospel. In fact, some of Paul's admonitions about women not taking authority over men some scholars believe that a better translation of that is don't usurp the authority of the men, meaning come for a woman, since there were priestesses of the pagan religions, to come in from the pagan temples and think that they were going to take over the churches that caused problems. Uh, apparently that had happened in Thyatira, and so they're admonished to not give in to this prophetess, which would have been someone from a pagan temple, a woman. Then Sardis. Um, John speaking, uh, John's vision, the Lord says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. It is one of the churches that he really kind of jumps on. Um, he tells them that their names uh, would, be, would be professed before the Father if they give up their sins. They're admonished to be watchful and, strength, and strengthen their faith uh, since their works have not yet been perfect before God. So they're one of the ones, Sardis is one of the ones that he's hardest on. Then Philadelphia, from the church in Philadelphia, those who overcome will be made a pillar in the temple of God, having the name of God. Um, we're told the New Jerusalem, they're praised for having some strength, keeping the word and not denying the name. They're admonished to hold fast to what they have so that no one can take away their crown, which they're in threat of having happen. I know your works have set before you an open door, no one can shut it. And then the Laodiceans, from uh, in Laodicea, he admonishes them to not be lukewarm. Uh, famous passage, uh, if you were hot, it's fine if you're hot or cold, but the lukewarm, I'll spit out of my mouth. There's an interesting thing there. The city of Laodicea was six kilometers away from a natural hot spring. And they had actually created a pipeline using hollowed out stones that were mortared together 
to bring hot water to Laodicea. But the thing is, after it had traveled through these stones for six kilometers, it wasn't really very hot anymore. It tended to be lukewarm. And so the suggestion is that with the Laodiceans, this idea of being lukewarm uh, was indicative of the fact that what they, they were proud of their supposed hot water, but it wasn't really hot. It was only lukewarm by the time it got to us. There's also a reference to gold refined in fire that they might be rich to buy white garments. This was a place that was known for goldsmithing. It was also a place that was known for, for um, weaving clothing. You know? And so all of, a lot of the little pieces in this do refer to specifics about these various towns. Okay? Any questions about the seven cities? I think the strong message, too, is that it's, there are specifics in here about the seven, the seven churches and the seven cities he's writing to, but it's a much bigger message than that. The idea is that this isn't just for those seven churches, but that these are the same messages that all of the churches in the midst of their persecution need to hear. Okay? Questions? Comments? Are you lukewarm? Suzanne, first. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Way back to... Uh... Emperor worship, you said they did sacrifices, required sacrifices. Would that have been the animals or well, something else? Actually, all they were required to do was burn incense. In fact, I mentioned Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna. He had been a close friend uh, of John when he was younger and John was older. And then Polycarp became, uh, he was the bishop of Smyrna, and he became a significant early church leader to Justice, Justin Martyr and others. Well, um, Polycarp, when he was a very old man, in his 80s, I think it was, if I remember right, um, he was told he had to burn incense to the emperor. And he was well loved by everybody. And they said, all you have to do is burn a little incense. That's all you have to do. Just light this incense and say that you, you, know, you accept the emperor as God. And he said, but if I do that, I deny Jesus. And how can I deny the one who has never done me anything but good? And so he was martyred because he wouldn't light some incense. So they didn't have to do anything spectacular. The thing was, though, if they actually would burn the incense to the emperor and declare the emperor to be divine, they would get a certificate. And that certificate was like a get-out-of-jail card. Nobody could accuse them of not having fulfilled the obligation of the emperor cult uh, if they had that certificate. And they, that, it also shows you that Domitian especially, and some of the other emperors, but Domitian was the worst, was meticulous about making sure everybody recognized him as being divine. To the point that he had people monitoring this um, and to, to go around and check whether or not they had fulfilled this and to give them a certificate if they did in case anybody wanted to check on them later. In fact, the early people, um, Domitian was the first emperor who declared himself also the public censor. All right? The word censor, that was an official government position in the Roman Empire and the, it's called censor because the person was responsible for the census. But they also were responsible for public morality, for making sure people uh, worshipped the gods appropriately and didn't commit crimes and all that sort of thing. And that's where we get the word censor and censorship in the term we usually use it, but the word is actually based on the same word as census. Well, Domitian was so intent that he be worshipped that he, made him, he gave himself the title of imperial censor and then assigned all of his people to go out and make sure they were worshipping him. That was the main point for him, of being the, the public censor. Okay. Yes, Roberta. I think uh, it's just a comment. Um, as we look at these churches and the messages to the churches, it speaks to us today. It is. Uh, it's not ancient. It, uh, it is absolutely contemporary. And, right. Um, I just. I love that. Yeah. I just love it. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Let's take a break. I've got two minutes after. Let's come back at twelve minutes after. I'll give you ten minutes. Uh, let's talk now about the next section of Revelation. Again, I, I'm going to, I've got the complete outline that's available to you online. I'm not going to go over all this stuff, but I want to talk for a, a little bit about some of the different interpretations based upon the four different ways of interpreting that I mentioned to you. And I want to give you, I'm going to take a few of the seals and give you an idea of how differently these things have been interpreted based upon whether you take the preterist, the historicist, the futurist, or the idealist view. And part of what I'm trying to indicate to you is that when you get in and study this, there are a lot of different ways you can interpret these things. Um, and some of them are undoubtedly wrong, but, some, but many of them I think are useful in terms of us having an understanding 
I, my tendency is to feel as though we are not called to make as literal an interpretation of the book of Revelation. In fact, I think we err when we try to make too literal an interpretation, even though uh, that's exactly what many people try to do. In fact, some of the book of Revelation has been the fodder for so much of people's attempt to try to predict exactly what's going to happen in the future. And that, that's not only a bad idea, it's actually a sin. Because Jesus says, no one knows the hour or the day. I mean, all of these people, Harold Camping and everybody else that's done this, they try to take Revelation as a primary source document, and they figure out some numerical sequence or whatever, and they go, okay, the Lord is coming back on December 11th. Okay. Um, well, Jesus said, I don't even know what the final day will be. Only the Father in heaven knows. And specifically, in at least three places in the New Testament, Jesus says, do not bother yourself with trying to figure this out because you're not going to know. In fact, if you think you figured it out, you're wrong by definition because it says that, that exactly when you think it's going to happen, it's not. And when you don't think it's going to happen, it will. We will be surprised like a thief in the night. Yes, Sierra? That's something that's always confused me when Jesus says he doesn't even know. Because he was God in the flesh. Right. So, like, was it something where he chose not to know while he was here? or? Well, there's a couple of different ways we might understand that. One of them is that Jesus was speaking while he was in the flesh. And the passage in Philippians, the Kenosis passage, says that uh, Jesus did not consider his divinity something to be grasped, but rather set it aside mm -hmm. when he became incarnate. It may have been that that's one of that, that kind of... Um, omniscience of what's going to happen may have been part of what he set aside. He didn't completely set aside his ability to know things because he knew what was in people's hearts and that sort of stuff. So we don't know exactly. That may be part of it. The other part of it may have been that um, this was Jesus saying God the Father has certain areas of responsibility that he, that are his. God the Son, there are certain things that he is responsible for. This sort of differentiation of duties, if you will. God the Holy Spirit has responsibilities. And it may very well be that the determination of the final day is not for the Son or the Spirit to determine. That is particularly within the providence of God the Father. I'm more inclined to think that way because you get into, I think we get in ourselves into a little bit of trouble when we start trying to parse what power did Jesus still have and what didn't he based upon the Genesis passage. So my sense is that, that it is clear God, the Holy Spirit, has certain responsibilities. There are things he does. He is our comforter. He is our convictor. He is our teacher and encourager. You know, Jesus is our Savior. He also was the one through whom all creation occurred, based on John 1. So there are certain things that God the Son was responsible for, mostly our salvation. And there are certain things that are only in the realm of uh, providence of God the Father. And it, based on what Jesus said, that appears to be God the Father who will decide when is the time full. You know, when has, when, in the fullness of time, as the King James says, you know, when is the right time? So, okay? All right, let's talk about seals. First, John comes through, uh, he comes before the throne of God. He has a vision of the throne of God. He sees before the throne 24 elders, the four living creatures, which are believed to be symbolic of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the Lamb, who is found worthy to break the seals on the judgment scroll of God. Now, judgment scrolls. Um, some of this language, as I say, we, it seems mysterious to us. We hear all this talk of scrolls and seals and all that. What does all that mean? Well, anybody reading this in the first century uh, or second century would have known clearly that a scroll in those days, particularly if it was a legal document, if you were sending a contract to someone, it would have a wax seal on it. You guys have watched the movies, you know, where they fold up letters and seal them. They did the same thing to scrolls. It would have a wax seal. That seal was not supposed to be broken except by someone for whom it was intended. In other words, the right person or the worthy person. In fact, in the case of legal circumstances, it was not supposed to be broken except by the right person in the presence of witnesses so that they could make sure that it did get to who it was supposed to go to and that they received the message, okay? <clears throat> so the idea that the Lamb of God is the only one found worthy to break the seals on the judgment scroll, it means nobody else is, is appropriate. Nobody else is, is good enough. Nobody else is the right one. Only the Lamb of God can open the seals, um, the seals of God the Father and, and present the message that's held in. So uh, that's one of the examples where it's mysterious to us, but it's simply... 
In the first century, second century, they would have known what a seal was. You break the seal only if you're the one that has a right to do it. And only the Lamb of God has the right to do it here in the vision of John. Okay? You get... <clears throat> he starts breaking open the seals. Now, the first seal is broken open, and a white horse appears whose crowned rider has a bow with which to conquer, we're told. Uh, specifically, uh, I'm reading here from the King James, but just so you get some of the color. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the scrolls, and I heard, as it were, a noise of thunder. One of the four beasts sang from the sea. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, there are very different interpretations of what this is. This white horse who appears given a crown with a bow to conquer. The preterist view identifies this first horseman as having been um, Artabanus, the king of the Parthians, who slaughtered the Jews in Babylon. <coughs> Meaning, he, the, the preterist view interprets all of this stuff as something that's already happened before us. Okay. Um, another, uh, Ernst Renan, a 19th century interpreter, said that the first horseman was symbolic of the Roman Empire, with Nero being the Antichrist. Now, that's the preterist view. All of this is past history for, for us. The historicist view, um, one scholar said that the first seal um, was representative of the death of Christ. The, another scholar associated the opening of the first seal with the year 73, which was during the reign of Vespasian, just after the great Jewish revolt. So this is a symbol of basically the Roman conquering of the Jews during the Jewish revolt that led up to AD 70, the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, another scholar has identified this period as having started with the death of Domitian, again, the Domitian who was persecuting, um, and the rise in power of Nerva in the year 96. Then there's the futurist view. This is all going to happen in the future. What they would say that this writer represents the Antichrist who will head the revived Roman Empire at the end of history after the rapture of the church. All of this is going to happen in the future. And the idealist view is that this writer is a symbol of the progress of the gospel of the conquering Christ mentioned in other places in Revelation. Now, I give you those four very different ideas because that's why I started out by telling you there's at least four different, very different approaches to interpretation. Do you believe this is all historical things that happened in the past and most of the preterist um, interpreters? identify specific historical figures in the past that this uh, white horseman would refer to. Uh, the historicist would say that it happened in history, but not necessarily in the far past. It may be more recent than that. The futurist to give us an idea that this is all going to happen in the last days, that this represents the Antichrist who will revive the Roman Empire. And then the symbolic view is that it represents the whole gospel of the conquering Christ um, in the future day. All right? Very different interpretations. So now you understand why I can't tell you whatever one of these things specifically means? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, we can go through and you can examine, in fact, you can go online and look at this. You can look at the preterist. Every one of the seals that get opened, they have a different interpretation. For instance, the second seal, which is the uh, red horse, whose rider is granted a great sword to take peace away from the earth. The preterists believe that was the great Jewish revolt and the insurrection of Vendox when the Jews tried to uh, fight the Romans. The historicist view associated with this with the whole Roman period that was fraught with civil war between AD 32 and the emperors that from AD 32 through to the end of the Roman Empire. The futurist view was that this represented the Antichrist who would release World War III and that that's the symbol this represents and they would crush anyone who claimed to be a Christian after the rapture. And then the idealist view says that the seals two through four represent the disintegration of both human civilization and creation resulting from the rejection of the Lamb of God. And we could keep going on through it, okay? Seal number three, we're told a black horse appears. I think that was my nose, okay. Who has a pair of measures in his hand, and a voice says, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. This is a time of famine. The fourth seal, a pale horse appears, whose rider is death, and uh, hell follows him. 
Death was granted a fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Then the fifth seal under the altar appears the souls of martyrs for the word of God who cry out for vengeance. They are given white robes and told to rest until the martyrdom of their brothers is complete. You then get the sixth seal, and in the sixth seal there are there's a great earthquake where the sun becomes black as sackcloth of hair and the moon like blood. The stars of the heaven fall to the earth and the sky recedes like a scroll being rolled up. Every mountain and island is moved out of place. The people of the earth retreat to caves in the mountains and the survivors call upon the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. I could go on, okay? Um, you, there are a lot of different interpretations of this, but I believe the thing that we need to understand is whether this does have specific historical references that, it pa that are past, or specific, the preterists, specific historical references that may have been future to John, but somewhere in the history between then and now, like the, the historicist, whether it is something that's being predicted for the end of time, later than us, in other words, um, or whether it is simply symbolic. All of those have something to recommend them. The problem we run into is we get so wrapped up in wanting to know what all this means, and we violate the principle that Jesus made very clear, and that is you're not going to figure it out in terms of what the future holds. Um, people who say, well, you know, okay, this, this symbol in the opening of that seal was the Antichrist, and that was Nero, and blah, blah, blah. Really? It was Nero, huh? You know, that's the wide belief is that Nero was the Antichrist. Uh, Nero lived... Hmm, 1900 years ago. What does that mean for the future? Any approach that we take that is rigid in its interpretation, no matter which of these four or some other creative approach, tends to want to um, limit, I believe, God's intention in terms of how he has reacted or interacted with humanity for the last 2,000 years and <coughs> will until the second coming of the Lord. And I don't think we have to find specific answers to this. I believe the idea that there will be famine, and there will be disease, and there will be war and conquering, and there will be earthquakes and natural disasters. To see all of that as part of God's judgment on the world, and that the Lamb of God is the one who is ultimately responsible for that, that to me is the major, the major, major message. Not specifically trying to identify which Roman emperor was it, or, you know... It's going to happen as World War III is going to be launched because the people in Ohio are going to attack the people in Indiana, you know, in blah, blah, year. I don't think that's where we're supposed to go with this, okay? Um, you don't need me to walk you through every one of these uh, seals. But then you get to the angel sounding the trumpets. And there are seven, uh, when they sound the trumpets... There are golden bowls which contain the wrath of God. The first bowl, a foul and loathsome sore, afflicts the followers of the beast. The second bowl, the sea turns to blood and everything within the sea dies. The third bowl, all fresh water turns to blood. The fourth bowl, the sun scorches the earth with intense heat. The fifth bowl, there's total darkness and great pain. The sixth bowl, preparations are made for a final battle between good and evil. The seventh bowl, a great earthquake in which every island fled away and the mountains were not found. There is natural disaster, there is destruction, there is judgment against humanity for our failure to follow Jesus Christ. First for our sin against God, and then for our failure to listen to the message that was given. Remember, all of this is being sent to the church. And some of it is cautionary because as the seven, seven churches, the notes of the seven churches, again literally the notes of the seven angels of the seven churches, um, about things are doing right and things are doing wrong. So the church needs to be aware and cautious as well. We're then, then introduced to Babylon the Great, who was considered to be a symbol probably for Rome, the great oppressor, the great harlot who sits on many waters, uh, and then Babylon is destroyed. The people of the earth mourn Babylon's destruction, the permanence of Babylon's destruction. And I've heard that Babylon the Great was... Germany in the Second World War, and I've heard a bunch of times people say, this is the United States, you know, we've messed up that, um, and on and on, all kinds of different explanations. We then come to, okay, um, I'm actually on that page, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the great multitudes that praise God, um, the marriage supper of the Lamb, we then come on to the millennium, 
where the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. Satan is imprisoned in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. The resurrected martyrs and those who have not worshipped the beast or his image during the tribulation live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Christ is released and attempts to make war against the people of God. Um, I'm sorry, Satan is released and attempts to make war against the people of God but is defeated after the thousand year reign. Satan is cast into the lake of fire. There is the last judgment of the wicked along with death and, and hell and they're cast into the lake of fire. Then the new heaven and the new earth replaces the old heaven and the old earth. There is no more suffering or death. God comes to dwell with humanity in the new Jerusalem. There is a description of new Jerusalem which you know, John in his vision is, tries to use the, the precious gemstones and minerals and things to describe the extraordinary vision he has of what the New Jerusalem is going to look like uh, because he didn't have words for it. And then the river and the trees of, tree of life appear for the healing of the nations and the curse is ended. And at the conclusion, Christ gives reassurance that his coming is imminent. You know, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord, and the final admonitions. All right? Now, lots of stuff in there. I want to give you one more uh, focus, and that is having to do with this, the, thou, the millennium, the thousand year reign, etc. There is very little that people, Christians, differ over more than the whole millennial issue. What's going to happen? What's this thousand year reign? Is it literally a thousand years? Does Jesus come back before it or after it? Do we go through the tribulation or are all Christians removed from earth before the tribulation so we don't have to suffer? And on and on and on. I'm, the, I'm going to get into this more specifically in two weeks in the eschatology in two weeks in theology class. I think it is. Um, well, not this week, but next week. Okay. Okay. But not, the theology class, we meet this Wednesday and the following. I think eschatology, it's either this week or it's Wednesday uh, of next week, so but we'll get to it. I'm going to get into a little more detail about this, but there are three primary ways to interpret the Revelation's description of end times. Um, first, there is the premillennialist or premillennialism kind of view. This is the belief that Jesus will return and will be physically on the earth for a 1,000 year literal reign. And that this, this is a literal interpretation of the Revelation 21 to 6 that I was just referring to. Now, it may be that this premillennial, that Jesus comes back for the thousand year reign on earth, happens either pre tribulation or post tribulation. I'll show you in a chart in a minute. The tribulation is the time of, uh, in which evil reigns, the people are, Christians are, are under tribulation. Or they're not, depending upon whether you think we get sucked out of here before that happens. So we'll. we'll... <laughs> um, I can't wait for the chart. Can't wait for the chart. <laughs> then we have amillennialism. Amillennialism, literally not millennialism, believes that the thousand year reign referred to in Revelation is a symbolic number. Again, all the numbers round off to three and a half or seven or one thousand. So the amillennialist belief is that the thousand year number is a symbolic number that the millennium has already begun and is the current church age. That Christ in effect, as the church exists as his body on earth, that that is the reign of Christ on earth. And that thousand, one thousand doesn't mean literally a thousand, it means a lot. There are going to be a lot of years in there. Then there is the post-millennial view, the belief that Jesus will, will return after a one thousand year golden age, during which time Christian ethics prosper. That Christianity grows and flourishes, it's well received for a thousand years, and then the Lord returns and there is the rapture and the final judgment. Now there are very different opinions about whether that thousand years is literal or figurative, even amongst the post-millennialists. This chart's kind of dark. It's kind of hard to see. Let me see if I can walk you through it. The first, the top, is the post-tribulation pre-millennialist. Okay, the second one, just so you know, is the pre-tribulation or dispensationalist pre-millennialist. I don't even think you need to remember all this. <laughs> but if I didn't mention this, somebody would go, well, what about the trib? What about millennialism? Okay. The top one, the post-tribulation millennialism, this is the cross of Christ. And then there is, uh, after, it's like we're in here. We get to a period of tribulation. Then you have the second coming of Jesus here. Then you have the 1,000 year or millennial reign. And then you have the last judgment. That is post-tribulation premillennialism. That the tribulation will happen before the thousand year reign. Uh, Jesus will come after the tribulation, before the millennium, and then there will be the last judgment after the thousand years. And Jesus is present on earth during this time period. 
Okay? Then you have a different version of premillennialism. Remember, premillennialism means that Jesus comes back before the millennium, before the thousand years. This is the cross. This is the, you know, the crucifixion and resurrection. And then you have the period of time we're in. Then there is the second coming of Jesus, which involves the rapture. Then you have the tribulation. So here Jesus comes after the tribulation. Here Jesus comes before the tribulation. Then you have the second coming with the church. So pre-tribulation, pre premillennialism, has Jesus coming back twice. First he comes back to rapture the church, take them out of, so they don't have to suffer tribulation. Then he comes back with the church, and he reigns for a thousand years on earth, and then we have the last judgment. I think that's wishful thinking. <laughs> the only real justification for that is people who don't want to believe that they're going to have to go through the tribulation so they get taken out first. I don't think we're ever promised that. In fact, I think we're pretty much promised we will suffer for our faith at some point. Then you have postmillennialism, much cleaner. You have, the cross. you have the period of time leading up to the millennium, and again, this isn't Jesus is not physically present. It is the time in which you know the gospel is presented, and in, you know the the church grows and is being blessed, and really you know the the, the uh, during this time, and then the second coming, and the last judgment. And then you have amillennialism, which means there isn't actually a 1,000-year reign, a 1,000, that it's a symbolic millennium, which is the current church age. Because we are the body of Christ present now, and 1,000 is, is a symbolic number. And then at the end of this, the second coming and last judgment. The only difference between these two is whether or not the 1,000 years refers to a literal millennium, a literal 1,000 years, or whether it is a, it's a symbolic number that means a long period of time during which Christ is present. And Christ is present in his body on earth. I am inclined toward amillennialism. Or, uh, I'll say this before somebody else does, some people say, well, I'm a panmillennialist. I believe it's all going to pan out in the end. <laughs> um, yes. This doesn't matter. <laughs> okay? <laughs> what you believe about, and the thing is, people are ready to shoot each other over this stuff sometimes. <laughs> This does not matter. I do not believe it has a fundamental difference in terms of how we experience our faith or how, what we believe about Jesus Christ. As long as we believe that there will be times of trouble, we are told we must maintain our faith in Christ during that time, not forsake the truth of the gospel, and that at the right time, whether it's before being on earth for a thousand years with us, or after a thousand, symbolic, whatever, Jesus Christ will come. There will be the final uh, reckoning before the great throne of grace, you know, the great white throne of judgment and grace. And Scripture says that the righteous will, you know, be taken with Him into an eternity of grace with Him, and the those who have chosen against Him will end up in the place that they have chosen. C.S. Lewis says that God. You know, God ultimately will get everyone what they ask for. If they ask to be separate, you know, to not have God's presence, then they will be given that. And there is only one place where God will not be present, and He has chosen not to be present in the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons. In Matthew 25. Now, the one thing that I want to emphasize, and this is the part of this that is most critical. I mentioned this earlier. Chapter 21 of Revelation. And I'm actually reading from, um, this is a Dr. Bible. This is NIV. This may be slightly different than your NIVs because they've done different versions of it. But chapter 21 of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. That's us. We are the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, John, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. 
That's the most important verse, I believe, in Revelation. Do not get wrapped up in what the seals mean and whether the red horse means this and the white horse means that and the black horse means something else. They mean bad things are coming. Okay, that's all we really need to know. But the point is, and, and the issue of whether Jesus comes before millennium or whether millennium is only a thousand or if it's a symbolic or whatever, this is the point. The first part of Revelation 21, that is what we look forward to and that's what we believe in. Everything else is, is the symbolism. Yes, we need to take it seriously. I'm not discounting the value of Revelation, but I think we go way too far when we try to figure out what every symbol in there means. Questions about that or comments? Anyone? Are you scared to death? Is that, is that what's going on? <laughs> oh, he almost wonders if it causes more trouble putting all those things in than if they haven't been there. Yeah, it gets it gets in trouble. You were saying? I thought Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins had it all figured out. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember Sunday school classes that centered around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. The charts. Oh, oh, yes. Yes. The charts. <laughs> Well, and I, I know Tim Lane and Jerry Jenkins, not well, but I know them. Uh, and they mean well, I think they're good people, but, um, you know, they sell books. Um, <laughs> but all I can say, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with us studying this and thinking about it as long as we don't get, you know, as long as we don't get it wrapped around our axle, you know? As long as we don't get to the place where we can't move forward with the things that are important because we get so stuck on the symbolism. Sierra? So the alienists, um, do they believe then that there's, that since it's like symbolic, is there also going to be a time where, like post millennials believe, where there's going to be a thousand years where <coughs> Christianity is like prospering? Or? Well, the amillennialists, and they will differ in terms of whether there's a progression within the, amillennial literally means not millennium. Ah uh, means no, not or no. So they don't believe there is a thousand years. They believe it's symbolic, and they believe that the whole of the symbolic millennium is the period of the church on earth. It is the, it's the church era that we are in that, if you will, the messianic age. Um, now, some of them would say that we're going to get progressively more Christian. In other words, the Christian church is going to grow. Some would say that the aspect of the tribulation is that it's, it's got, going to get worse, actually, before the Lord comes back, and then we're going to go through difficult times. They differ on that. So they do believe, some of them do believe there will be a tribulation. Right. Well, that, but not, it's not like yeah. here, it starts here. Mm -hmm. It's just that some believe that, that the righteousness of God and the testimony of the church will grow until the Lord comes back. Um, and Scripture says that he's, he is tarrying because he wants more people to have a chance to hear the good news, to hear the word. Some say that the church era will continue to witness and testify, but will get worse. You know, the tribulation, the persecution will get worse. And that, it, you know, at that at, when that persecution is really in full bloom, then the Lord will come back. They differ on that. But the Amillennialists would say there's not a thousand years, whether you believe pre-trib, post-trib, whatever, there's not a thousand years during which Jesus will be on earth. He's on earth right now because we, he's present in the body, in his body, which is the church. Okay, Mark? I think the phrase they use is in the fullness of time. It's an right. era. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah, the Old Testament, uh, or the uh, King James Version is in the fullness of time. God does this. And the fullness, the fullness of time is an, an archaic way of saying, when the time's right, you know, when the right time gets here, then God will do these things. But we don't know exactly when, and again, if you get too wrapped up in trying to interpret the symbols, we'll, we'll get a little crazy, and we'll also be distracted from the things that are really important. Okay? That's the thing we can't allow ourselves to do. Any other questions or comments about this? I had thought I might go into more of the seven trumpets and all of that kind of stuff, but I decided as I was doing this, no, you don't need that. Because the very fact that if you, you can go online and look up interpretations of Revelation, and they'll give you, for all of the different symbols, here is the preterist view, here's the historicist view, here is the idealist view, you know, here's the futurist view. I don't know that that helps us very much, other than to know that there are a whole boatload of different interpretations of this stuff. I'm very pragmatic about what God wants us to do with the Bible. And it does not involve spending all of our time trying to figure out what the third seal means. Okay, unless you're writing a scary movie or something. <laughs> um, any other questions or comments? 
If not, I think I'm done for the day. I'm going to let you loose early because, again, I'm sending you way more detail, but I don't think that's needed. Thank you all. God bless you.